everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein, and today I'm especially delighted to welcome my friend and world-class intuitive and so many other things, Lori Lambert-Williams. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little tiny bit about Lori, but I won't even come close to encapsulating all of the wonderful things about her. Um, so Lori is... A, as I mentioned, a world-class intuitive, and she'll tell you more about that and about her work with remote viewing. She is, I would consider her an environmentalist and someone who is really passionate about um, the, the planet and um, just living a good life. You're a mother of seven. I don't know how relevant uh, that is to remote viewing, although I think mothers are pretty intuitive. And you're the author of two books. The most recent is Boundless. So Lori, I'm going to let you tell a little bit more about you and your journey and your work. So take it from there. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. I'm super happy to be here with you. It's so fun uh, to do interviews with people who are friends because then we can just talk and it's so much more exciting than when you have kind of a stilted thing, you know, with just questions and answers. So it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I've had kind of a Forrest Gump type journey. If you think <laughs> Forrest Gump for women, you know. <laughs> She's, she's really sweet and very nice, but we can't get her to, to focus. We get, I, I had really bad attention deficit disorder is what, what it was, but they didn't know that back then. They didn't even have a name for that. So. I think what you're saying is you're kind of not, there's this phrase now about being neurotypical or, you know, maybe uh, I'm not sure what the opposite of that would be. I'm sure someone will correct me, but the thing is a lot of us really aren't neurotypical, right? We have brains that are you know, if people don't get it, they consider it a liability or a challenge, and yet it can actually open up a whole realm of possibility um, yeah. because you're able to live outside the box, and you've certainly done that. Yeah, it's really, it's really, really funny um, that just allowing yourself to, to live in the flow and, and let life take you where it takes you can actually be so much more astonishing and amazing than when you live a very controlled, planned out thing. And who really ever has that happen? I mean, a lot of us end up in a very different place than we thought we would end up, right? <laughs> so uh, I originally, when I was 14 and uh, like three weeks old, um, I met these Jesus people hippies in a park one day. And I had a, a tremendous spiritual experience with them. We talked for five hours and my life was never the same after that. I saw things differently. And, um, and then I ended up when I graduated from high school, which I did at 16. Wow. I, I wanted to get out really bad. I didn't like high school. So I wanted out of high school. <laughs> so I graduated at 16 and I ended up, my parents gave me permission to travel with this group, which, you know, has since kind of become thought of as a cult, you know, as there are many cults springing up in the early seventies. And uh, cause I'm 64 and when people say, oh, you know, you know, you say, how old are you? And they say, I really, I'd rather not say, I always say, okay, then just tell me how much you weigh. You know? <laughs> I figure we'll get past this all really quickly, but, <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be 65 in June. And so uh, in this, this was the early seventies and there were a lot of cults springing up <clears throat> and I, you know, and I, of course, nobody thought of, they weren't called cults back then. And so I ended up in this cult and um, it actually really was, a, a, I was there for 20 years and it was actually a, a mind blowing experience. And I had a lot of wonderful experiences. You know, people always think, oh my God, you poor thing, you were in a cult, oh my gosh. Um, you know, and of course, you know, like anyone, I think we all experience negative experiences in our lives. It's what teaches us, right? So yeah, I had a few not so great experiences, but I also had many fabulous, wonderful experiences that gave me some great coping skills, really great crisis management skills, and, and other, you know, social skills that don't necessarily run in our family, you know, so some of my siblings have been like, how come you're so different? I, well, I think I got some of the, my corners knocked off in that group I was in for 20 years, you know? And so you've also done a lot of work on yourself. You know, you've done so many interesting things. It sounds like you've grown really significantly from. I, I really believe that that's why we're here, right? We're all here to grow. I mean, life is just a great big school. And so, you know, when anything happens, whether you consider it a positive thing or a negative thing, when anything happens um, and you kind of are on this roller coaster of life and things, there's ups and there's downs. 
I kind of look at it like, okay, this is all just part of the school. So what am I supposed to learn from this? And I found that that is really helpful. And one thing that there, the cult was really big on was correction. You know, and most of us don't handle that well. We don't handle correction well. We don't handle authority well. And so I really learned um, right away that if I was open to hearing what was being said, that I would really, I could really benefit from it. But if I shut myself down, and it was never delivered in a mean, ugly way. It was always very loving. Um, you know, so, but if I shut myself down or kind of was like, and initially, you know, as soon as someone comes and goes, you know, can I be honest with you? You, you know, you kind of put up your guard, like, uh-oh, what are they going to say? <laughs> like, please well, don't. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> you know, what are they going to say to me? What, you know, uh, like you talk too loud or, you know, whatever, whatever's coming. I remember that um, we, we were kind of going through this interview, my, my first husband and I, and uh, every time they'd ask him a question, I answered it. And we got married really young. I was, I was 18. I just answered every question they asked him. And finally, this woman said, could I speak to you for a moment? And she kind of pulls me aside. She's like, every time I ask him a question, you're answering it. And I said, yeah. And I, you know, I had no problem admitting the, yeah, for, yeah, I sure am. She's like, why are you doing that? And I said, well, cause I'm afraid he's not going to give you the right answer. <laughs> Now I laugh about it because it seems so <laughs> audacious and, you know, so arrogant. But back then it seemed like, you know, of course I have to answer for him. He's not going to give you, he's not going to be able to answer. <laughs> and, so, and so I learned a lot of things about, uh, you know, because I, I was in our family, we were very bold, you know, you just kind of threw yourself out there and just be as wacky and crazy and loud and obnoxious. And I, I really kind of learned how to be a little more circumspect and that everything doesn't have to be, you know, upfront and loud and crazy, that there's a lot to be gained from silence and, and listening. <laughs> well, Lori, I, I, tell me if I'm jumping too far ahead, because what you just said, I, I think is part of what makes you such a good intuitive, because what you just described is, you know, not taking things personally right? Being open to things being different from what you want them to be or what you want to hear, or what you want to perceive and creating space for silence. And I'm thinking to some of the, first of all, I, I, I think there might be people who don't know what remote viewing is and that that is a huge part of your daily life and your professional life. Um, so before we get into that and why I think that makes you so especially, so especially skilled. I'm wondering if you could give a, a quick snapshot of your remote viewing journey, because when you started this, you were a mom with seven children um, and, and managing that extremely well. Um, and then also- I think, taking I think that's up for debate. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to interview my kids after this. <laughs> you had been a clinical social worker. So you had done a lot. Um, and you already had a lot of skills, but then you decided to pursue this incredibly intense training for a long time to become this master intuitive. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about yeah. that. Well, you know, when, so when I'm, in, when I'm in this religious group, right, and, and you know, supposedly following the Bible, I mean, I memorized tons of scriptures, but my whole life I'd had experiences that um, were you know, abnormal, I guess. And at the time, I didn't realize how abnormal they were. Um, I, th I thought maybe everybody had the same kinds of experiences. And it wasn't until later that I realized, no, a lot of the things that have happened to me are, you know, have no explanation in, in our current understanding of reality, right? Um, and so, you know, like we had, we had poltergeists in my house and stuff. In every, almost every house I've lived in, there has been psychokinetic activity where objects move without anyone being there to move them, anyone visible. An Oh, for sure. Like, oh, well, the, the strongest, biggest example was a house we were living in in Amarillo, and I would tra train students there. And um, we had a lot of psychokinetic activity happening that, you know, would sometimes happen in front of the students. But, um, but the strongest one happened when I was alone, and I, we had just gotten back from Sam's Club, and I bought this big thing of laundry soap with a spigot on it. And I put it on the counter in the laundry room, and I went out and did some things and came back in. And it was on the floor with the spigot pointing up. And I thought, now who put this on the floor? So I pick it up, I put it back on the counter and I step back a couple of feet to fill up my glass because we had a reverse osmosis in there. I was gonna get a drink of water. So I step back a couple of feet and that 
right in front of my eyes, the laundry soap lifted up in the air about two feet above my head, spun around once, and then went down and landed on the ground with the spigot up in exactly the same spot I had seen it when I came in. So I, <laughs> I called Jim. With your husband. eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. my husband is, a, is a, forensic, a, a former forensic scientist. So I call him in and I said, I told him what happened. And I said, is there anywhere in the world of physics that you understand that that could have happened? And he's like, nope, <laughs> no, nope, no way that that could have happened. Um, but <laughs> just to clarify, the listening who may be unfamiliar, so psychokinesis being um, kinetic movement, movement of something outside of a person due to some sort of energetic, you know, force that the person is usually not consciously aware of exerting and something that does not require physical contact. Exactly. Um, and that, yeah, really, that's been a thing for me in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and it keeps happening. Um, not too long ago, Jim and I were watching a movie on the laptop on the kitchen table and his glasses were sitting on the table and they just started kind of hopping across the table by themselves. And where Jim was sitting, the laptop was blocking his view of that. And I'm leaning over and I'm like, Jim, your, your glasses are hopping across the table. And he leans over and he watches them hop and he goes, well, I'll be damned, they are. <laughs> you know, just like he's gotten so used to it because, and I asked him, I said, has this kind of stuff happened to you all your life? He's like, not until I married you. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> So this was happening when you were involved in this religious organization, you're calling it a cult, you know, and um, that it was, you know, very, I'm assuming very indoctrin heavy on indoctrination and kind of like, this is the way you do things. I'm assuming, and I shouldn't assume, but that these experiences, psychic experiences, psychokinetic experiences are probably not in the framework Exactly. Of the group. You're walking a fine line between the Lord and the devil because, because um, according to those, the, those teachings, because if you, depending on your vernacular, like if you said, I, I had a, a dream from the Lord and he told me this and this and this is going to happen and then it happens, then it's like, oh, you know, maybe you have the gift of prophecy, right? So that's all in a, in a very um, biblical vernacular. Um, whereas if you say, hey, I had a, I had a psychic vision, well, then that's like, that could be of the devil. I mean, that's like, oh, you know, watch out. And so I learned that it's all in the vernacular. I mean, the word psychic was like a four letter word, never to be spoken, but it was okay if you framed it like I, I had a word from the Lord or this, you know, whatever. So um, I was very much in that indoctrination, very indoctrinated into that thinking. And so I was kind of felt like I was walking a fine line, you know, I better be careful because, you know, you never know, you could get demon possessed. That was, you know, the fear. You know, a lot of religion is so based in fear. And so there was a lot of fear that, you know, you could get demon possessed or, you know, some terrible thing might befall you if you displease the Lord. And so I, I just kind of was all like nervous about it. Like, what does this mean? Like if I saw spirits that, you know, nobody else could see and they told me information that I couldn't possibly know that turned out to be true or, and I would have precognitive dreams that would come true all the time. I would hear, I would get warnings uh, you know, that would like warn me and save, you know, save not only my life, but other people that I was with, uh, that I would hear very clearly in my mind. So I decided that was an angel that was just, you know, warning me and helping me and saving our lives. Um, you know, and I would come up with reasons why these things would happen. Okay, well, this happened because, you know, I have an angel that's helping or, you know, whatever. But when I left the group, I was 34, had seven kids, and you were already a clinical social worker at this time, or you went back after? No, no, I was 34. We, I had never really, I mean, I'd had one short stint of, of working a real job job, but I, I came to the United States and, you know, we, with the seven kids, um, my youngest was like nine months old and um, I, we landed at my sister's apartment. Because um, you've been living in? And we'd been living in Chile and we, we were in Ecuador for six years and we were in Chile for four years. So we land in Amarillo, Texas at my sister's apartment and she took us all in. And so we, I called the wrong number 
and, and, and so many things had changed. I'd been out of the country for many years. And so my kids had never seen a gumball machine. Um, I, we land in Miami and I, I gave my oldest daughter money to go buy everybody um, something to drink from that vending machine over there. And I turn around and they're all standing there with these cold cans of pop. It's like hundred degrees outside. And I'm like, why are you guys not drinking? And they said, we don't know how to open them. And I realized they had never seen a pop top lid, you know? And so they didn't, they'd never seen a pop top lid or a gumball machine, or I'm trying to remember if they'd ever seen an escalator. There were just so many things they had never seen before. And they were amazed and everyone was speaking English. You know, it was a huge, huge thing. And um, so I call this wrong number on the phone <clears throat> and I ended up getting hired by this, this, they had just had lifted a hiring freeze at the Texas Department of Human Services. And I had the, the wrong number I called uh, got me talking to the head of personnel for the entire Texas Department of Human Services. And so he says, hey, we just, he, I said, I'm so sorry, I know I sound strange. And my mother said, even the way I spoke sounded really odd. Like I was speaking everything with almost like a Spanish accent because I'd been in Latin America for, yeah, many, many for years. So I, you know, I, I, all my A's, all my like ass ah sounds were ah, you know, things okay. like that. So she's like, you don't even sound American anymore. So I say to this person that I'm obviously calling the wrong number. I said, I'm so sorry. I know I'm calling a wrong number, but I'm, I don't even, I didn't even know how to make a long distance phone call because while I was gone, Ma Bell sold out, be, was found to be a monopoly. They broke up Ma Bell. And so I tried to make a long distance phone call at the airport. I said, I need to make a collect call. And they said, what? What long distance carrier do you use? And I said, what is a long distance carrier? <laughs> the operator hung up on me. She hung up on me. So then I called the operator, another one, and said, hey, don't hang up on me. I am just back in the States after many years gone. When I left, you could pick up a phone and say, I want to make a collect call and they would dial it for you. She said, no, while you were gone, you know, Ma Bell sold out. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> long story short, I mean, I was like an alien on a foreign planet. And I, I, so I explained to this guy, let's, I've been out of the States for many years and, and I don't even know what I'm doing. I can barely make a phone call, you know? And he says, well, where were you? And I said, I was in Latin America. And he said, oh, you speak Spanish. And we ended up in this fascinating conversation. So he ends up saying, hey, would you like to come and test for this job opening as a social worker? Which is so something I, you can't even make up that a wrong number <laughs> leads to a job in a completely different state. I know. No sense at all. Everybody I talked to that had that job said it took them over a year to get it. It was a huge hiring thing and that, you know, they had to go through all these hoops. And instead I go and I show up at this testing site the next day. I took the test. I finished the test 20 minutes before everybody else. And he comes running up and he's like, wow, you finished that test and you aced it. He's like, uh, can you get me your transcripts? And I literally said to him, this is so embarrassing, Tracy. I said, what are transcripts? <laughs> goes, you know, your, your university transcript. And I said, well, I don't have a degree. He said, you don't have a degree. I said, no. And he said, well, well, let's do an interview because sometimes, you know, we can exchange experience for a degree. So then I guess I aced the interview. And so he hired me. And then he was bragging to people that he had hired this woman who aced this test and all this. And then I'm in the orientation with 50 other people. And I'm constantly raising my hand. Excuse me, what is a W-2? <laughs> what is a deductible? I, I had never had insurance. I had never had a W-2. I, you know, I, and they're like, this is the woman you're bragging about. <laughs> like She's like a weirdo. <laughs> so, so it was really a crazy thing, but I, so I get, I get out and in the States now, and now I'm actually, you know, living in a, in a regular house with a regular job. And I'm, <clears throat> you know, with just me and my kids and my husband and, uh, and I'm like, okay, I really want to search what all these weird experiences I've had my whole life are. I want to find this out. So I start researching and reading and I'm looking for a way to reconcile all these weird things that have happened my whole life with my belief system, which was very binary, you know, God and the devil and heaven and hell, you know, very binary belief system, very black and white. And so I'm trying to reconcile this and uh, a few years go by and I had just gotten a new job being hired as the head of a refugee resettlement program. And uh, that job required a master's degree, hired me without it. You know, so I just wow. gotten two jobs that required deg degrees that I got hired without. <clears throat> and now I've been in the States for five years. And so I just gotten hired and, um, and I was really looking for a way to do this. And I went to a conference on refugee mental health and post-traumatic stress disorder and I'm attending this conference in Denver when this man um, 
was talking, he was doing a presentation and he was a psychologist and I was fascinated by what he said. I don't remember now even what he was talking about, but I just thought, wow, this is interesting. And that night I dreamt about him and I dreamt that I was telling him about this colonel in, that I had just met. I had never met a colonel in my life and I just met this colonel and, uh, and this guy was a retired colonel. So the next day I get to the, to the conference early and I see him and I tell him that I had this dream about him. And he says, tell me the dream. And I told him and I said, and he said, what, what branch of the military is this colonel in that you met? And I said, I have mili I think military intelligence. And I know nothing about the military, like zero. <clears throat> so I was like, I military intelligence. And he said, I was in military intelligence. And as he said that, the cover of a book that had just come out that was called Psychic Warrior. And it was the, the history written by David Morehouse of of this program that had just gotten declassified that was a top secret psychic spying program that the US government had come up with an answer to the Soviets getting a lot of our military secrets during the Cold War. And this man defected with papers showing that the Soviets had a psychic spying program. So if they've got one, we got to have one. Yeah, they go to Stanford. don't know that we had one for 20 something years, actually. It was 20 years. And every single year they had to do a dog and pony show for the big brass and prove that it worked in order to get funding for the next year. And if they couldn't prove it, they couldn't get the funding. So they were funded for over 20 years. And so they, they definitely proved it. Um, in fact, when Jimmy Carter was asked, um, uh, right. I, I, I had a student who was, worked for the Travel Channel and the way she ended up becoming my student was that she was doing a show called Secrets Of, and, and one episode was called Secrets of the White House. And she was interviewing Jimmy Carter and she said, what was the weirdest, like most bizarre thing as president? And he said, it was when the remote viewers found the missing, the downed missing Russian plane. And so then she's like, what remote viewers? What are those? You know, and, and uh, so then she decided to research remote viewing somehow. Anyway, she ended up on my doorstep, but <laughs> to, to make a long story short, but anyway, so in, in, when I, when I suddenly saw this book flash in my mind, I said, have you seen this new book that's out about psychics in the military? And he said, are you talking about psychic warrior? And I was like, yes, that's the book. And he said, I can't believe that you're asking me about that book because I was a main character in that book. I was the uh, psychologist in charge of like vetting the guys that would go into the unit. Well, then he's like really weirded out because here this strange woman has a dream about him and then asks him about this program that he he had been in for 20 years. And he was kind of like amazed. So he starts leaning into my space. And this was pre-internet, just so people know. This was not- Well, it was the very beginning of the internet. It was 19, this was 1996. And so the internet was new, pretty so new. But most people weren't surfing and finding information like they are now. So it's not exactly. that you could yeah. have been just, you know, looking on your phone. For information <laughs> no, no. About this guy. <laughs> no. In fact, I think I had a, one of those Nokia, like look like little bricks kind of phone. <laughs> but um, and so, yeah, so he was like, he leans into my space and he's like, oh my gosh, he starts just throwing questions at me. Oh man, we would have loved to have you in our unit. And I was just like, ah. You know, and because I was a lot more fearful back then, I was suddenly imagining, you know, men in black coming to kidnap me, you know, <laughs> you know getting That's all what happened. <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> and uh, so I really kind of at that point wanted to get away from him, to be honest. I was kind of freaked out. And uh, mainly because he was just asking me so many questions, you know, like really leaning forward and super excited. So I, I was like, ah. so he says, when you get back home, go on the internet and see if you can look up remote viewing, controlled remote viewing. Which no so, one would have known to look up then because it's it's a lot of people, most people still don't know to look that up now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I had never done any surfing on the internet at all. It was still very new. And so I was like, can I even do that? You know, I was wondering. So when I got home, I tried and I found it. And the thing that came up was Lynn Buchanan's website. And Lynn had been a trainer in this top secret unit uh, that had just only months before gotten declassified. Um, so military I, unit, it, yes, it military intelligence secret program at the time and for a yes. long time after. And, and, and was a sergeant, I believe. He what? was, he, yeah, he was a sergeant. Okay. And so he, he had a website that said, what is CRV? So I read it. And when I read it, Old Trace, viewing. 
yes, what is controlled remote viewing? But it said, what is CRV with the initial CRV? Okay. But yes, when that stood for controlled remote viewing. And when I read it, it just suddenly was like, oh, this is this was what I've been looking for because it was based in brain science. And basically it was based on the premise that all humans have a part of them that is intuitive. It's I love part that of you're saying that. Yeah, we're just, I mean, it was part of the way God made us. And it's no more evil than your eyesight or your hearing, your ability to smell or taste. It's just, you know, it's not evil at all. It's just another sense that we have. Um, so that, you know, oog and og are tromping through the primeval forest and they hear a twig snap behind them. The one who says saber tooth tiger and is, you know, flying ahead lives while the one who turns around and says, what was that? gets eaten, right? So, so um, it's part of our survival skills, you know, right. the ability to intuit danger, for example, and sense danger. And I doubt there's anyone in the world today that hasn't at least had a, a moment of precognition or a sense, like you walk into a room and you're just like, mm, something's not right in here. Something doesn't feel right. Or I, sh I need to leave, or I shouldn't get on that plane, or I need to call my mother. You know, like, like one day I'm driving down the street. This was many years ago. I'm driving down the street. I think it was 2000, 2004. It's early 2004. I'm driving down the street and I literally hear a voice in my head say, pull over and call your mother right now. And so I, I just jerk into this parking lot and I immediately call my mother and she's like hysterical on the phone. And I say, mom, what's wrong, what's wrong? She says, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. I said, mom, you're supposed to tell me because I was driving down the street and this voice told me to pull over and call you. So you're, I'm sure you're meant to tell me, God wants you to tell me. <laughs> and she, I had to pull the God card, right? And she says, oh, you and that damned ESP. <laughs> and, and well, it had turned out she had just come home from getting a terminal diagnosis about my dad, that he had cancer and he was going to die. And so she was hysterical, but he didn't want her to tell the children, don't tell the children yet, you know, till we find out more kind of a thing. So but she was, yeah. So, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, these things are, we are surrounded by mystery that, you know, the world reality is a mystery. And I became obsessively fascinated with the mystery. That's really the truth of it. I became so fascinated with the mystery. I wanted to dive in with my whole heart and study controlled remote viewing, which is based on the activity between the right brain and the left brain, between the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, um, and, and really dealing in time and reality. And, uh, you know, just, it really opened up my world so much and it relieved so much agonizing fears that I had to learn that this is a normal thing. You know, I wasn't a weirdo or a freak or anything. And this is really something everybody has. And some people are more tuned into it than others. Absolutely. You know, uh, I think also I might've been affected by an incident that happened that I don't even remember that, that my mother told me about, but apparently I had an incident as a baby where um, I, I had, they we're not sure if it was a febrile seizure or if I was choking on something. Um, uh, so one, one or the other happened, but I stopped breathing. I turned blue. My eyes were open, fixed and glassy. And, uh, you know, and, and my parents rushed me to the hospital and somehow I was revived, but they do think that for there, there is a high number. There have been studies done showing that a high number of children who have, or even adults who have, um, a, a period of time where they are clinically dead. I don't know that I was clinically dead. I don't have any hospital records to prove that, but uh, but people who have been clinically dead for any length of time, often when they come out of it or are revived, have a much higher degree of psychic ability. Right. And, any kind of trauma, illness, accidents. I'm thinking of like John Holland had a horrible car accident that amped up his psychic ability. A lot, a lot of other people have described having high fevers and things like that. That changed yes. something. <clears throat> yes. I, I, I want to tie it back to you know, you were talking at the beginning about being, I, I said, you know, not neurotypical, but, you know, being kind of unique, but your life experiences and the way your particular brain is wired have made you again, literally a world-class remote viewer, a very controlled, um, so super psychically skilled generally, but also at this very structured um, methodology for being intuitive that was developed by our own military um, and that you now teach and you have written about. 
And so you have worked very hard to make take this out of the shadows and make this accessible to people. I'm wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yes, it became a real passion of mine when I discovered it. I thought, well, how many people, if they, <clears throat> excuse me, how many people, if they had the ability to control spontaneous weirdness, if they had the ability to get yeah. information on demand when they need it, how would that change their lives? You know, like, how would that change their careers or their finances or their relationships? You know, I mean, it, you can think of all the different ways this could affect you if you had the ability to get information when needed, as needed. And I, I just became passionate about somehow synthesizing it because it's very abstract when you think about it. You know, it's definitely a mystery. It's kind of like electricity. We, we, we turn on lights, but we don't really understand it, right? So we but can- it still use... works. <laughs> yeah, it still works. It's not real because we don't know exactly how it works. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the doctors in the 1800s that scoffed when they talked about germs, like, oh yes, there are little invisible things that can make you sick. You know, they, they thought that was ridiculous. Um, so we do find that there is an unseen world that can affect us and that reality is not what we necessarily think it is. And so um, as I dove deeper into this, um, I was I don't think I considered myself and still don't consider myself a very disciplined person. And CRV is really a, a very much a martial art. And so I had this wonderful instructor, Lynn Buchanan, who was great about helping me with the wax on wax off part of, <laughs> of the martial art, you know, but it became a brain discipline, which really helped me because I do have really bad ADHD. So kind of forcing me to use a structure to, to access and report intuitive information was so helpful with my ADHD. It kind of focused me, you know, it caused me to focus on this structure, getting my conscious mind busy with that so that my subconscious mind could come through and then practice, practice, practice. Well, I knew from the first day that I took the class that I was meant to teach this. My, from my very first day of my very first class, I was like, I am meant to teach this. And I just became really determined that I was going to just learn it so well. So um, Lynn had, I had signed an agreement with Lynn Buchanan. In fact, any student that studies with him or with me has to sign an agreement. And that one of the agreements is that you won't try to teach this until two years after you have taken the advanced course. And the reason for that isn't, has nothing to do with competition or money. It has to do with the fact that there were a lot of people who would take a three-day course, hang out a shingle as an expert and start charging people to teach it when they had no basis in their own experience. And it's through practicing and actually doing the remote viewing practice skill, the skill of it that really teaches you. And really you get into the layers of it, you know, the deeper layers so Lynn was trying to keep that, you know, a bunch of people from just tricking people and, and teaching garbage. Um, so t the day I hit that two-year mark, I called Lynn and said, I want to teach this class. And he said, well, if you really want to teach it, if you want to teach my course, you're going to have to come to every class I teach until I determine that you're ready. Now, as you mentioned, I had seven children. They were all homeschooling at the time. I was also running a refugee resettlement program that kept me busy 24 seven. I usually often work 60 hour weeks and I had to travel quite a bit. And I had a pretty crazy marriage at the time as well. And the house was kind of a circus. So it was like, well, um, okay, so I'm going to throw this into the juggling act, but I just knew I had to. And now I look back and think, I don't think I, nowadays I would have the wherewithal to do that, the stamina, the tenaciousness. So I, I don't know how I did it, but I guess, you know, God gives you power for the hour kind of thing. <laughs> you know? So, so what I had to do is every other weekend, I would have to get off work and drive to six hours to Alamogordo, New Mexico, where Lynn lives, study with him for three days, and then come home, you know, and jump back into work again. And I did that every other weekend. And I did that for like two years. I don't know how you did it. And I think <laughs> that's where I think that miracles actually exist. Um, I think so too. And I do have to give credit though, to the people we were living, people that were staying with us, my, my, uh, uh, my husband's sister and her husband kind of stayed home and kind of kept the home fires burning. So I could actually do that. And that made it possible because my, uh, then husband also was, or my husband, as they say, <laughs> my husband was, <laughs> was, uh, at the time was, well, he was doing long haul truck driving. So he wow. wasn't 
he was never home either. So, you know, so this was every other weekend away from the home and, and they kept the home fires burning and, and uh, my kids adore them to this day. They were like a second set of parents, you know, but um, anyway, so that's how I got into it. And I just was ferociously passionate and I still share that same passion. That's the thing is that I love it and I still love it. And I love teaching people. I love seeing their eyes light up and how excited they get when they do it. So back in 2019, I was like, how can I get this out to more people? How can I share it with more people? And I thought, well, what I need to do is create a free class that's totally free that people can take and decide is if this is something that they really want to do or not. Which is huge. It's huge because it, it's not something you're going to learn in five minutes. It's not something that you can do just from reading a book. Exactly. And so I was like, okay. A book is helpful. <laughs> yeah. I, I, my, my goal in writing these books is to see if, if I can teach people how to do it from a book. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke. But I, I mean, <laughs> what, I, I guess what I'm saying is the, the depth that your classes offer really helps people to get past their own, um, does this work, is this possible, and helps them to learn the technology. And I think the book's a wonderful complement to that. Too. That's what I was, that's another thing too, is I thought eventually I'm hoping to have the whole, all six phases. The first book is the first phase of, of the remote viewing process. It's like, it's like eight hours of, of what I teach on the first day of a three-day workshop. Um, and, uh, and it's very, complete, I think, you know, yeah. in my opinion, it's pretty complete, yeah. but I, I gave it to a lot of people to read and critique before I actually finalized it and published it. Uh, but so it's a very complete book, but then I want to write phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, and phase six. And I have a son-in-law who became like lit literally a virtuoso as a guitarist and even teaches guitar and things. And he learned it all from a book. So there are certain types of people. I think it's certain types of brains because my my daughter, who is literally genius level and works as a CPA, is like, I could never learn that from a book. I could not learn how to play the guitar from a book. You know, there's just I think it takes a certain type of brain for that. Um, but he's amazingly good. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I think, though, that the key to all of this is is that um, it, we have to make it so the masses can learn it because you can be sure that, you know, if, if somebody is going to use something in a bad way, there's going to be people, it's kind of like, you know, some people, I, uh, some people might have a weapon, for example, that they just use to hang on the wall because it's beautiful, <laughs> whereas other people might use it to harm someone. So um, it's, I think it's important for people to have the ability to learn, I think it should be in high school, like an elective, but like anything, like learning to play the piano or any, or, you know, taking a martial arts class, some people are going to jump into it and go, eh, this isn't for me. And other people are going to jump into it and go, oh my God. I mean, I'm, I'm meant to play on in Carnegie Hall. So, um, so I think that everybody should have the opportunity. A yeah. guitar can take you places you couldn't go on foot, but if you don't learn to drive well or drive responsibly, it becomes a, a liability and not an asset. Exactly. Remote viewing takes you places you cannot necessarily get with your normal kind of way of thinking, right? You know, exactly. without training your intuition, it becomes this random, it's this random thing that you hope happens maybe, or that scares you when it does, but with training, you can be more accurate and it's more volitional and. Exactly. And I think it keeps you safer to have, you know, to be trained by someone who really knows what they're doing, like a, a, a reputable trainer who has integrity. Um, that's, that's a key thing because there's lots of people out there who are not reputable, who don't have integrity. Right. Um, so that's, a, that was a key thing that drew me to Lynn Buchanan because he was always concerned first about the student. You know, it was always the student's well-being and welfare. That was always his primary objective. Right. And that what I loved, I loved that. But what really surprised me is I took a poll a while back of students and asked them what they felt like the, the number one greatest benefit that they got from learning and becoming remote viewers. I thought they would say, oh, you know, now I can see the dawn of time. I can, you know, I can remote view the dawn of time or whatever. No, they all said confidence, that it's given them greater confidence in their lives and that that's what they consider to be the greatest benefit. And I was blown away. I, I got a letter from a stranger recently who took the free class and has kind of been following me because I, I have a lot of free stuff that I put out all the time. I'm yeah, really wanting, wanting people to just have lots of information. And, um, 
And he wrote me this beautiful letter and said that because of what of the free class and the other stuff, he said, I, I think I feel like you're teaching me what real love is. And I was like, oh my gosh, that just that made my year. You know, it wasn't just, it just the world better. <clears throat> yeah. And and we do kind of bathe everything in that. We I want my company to all to be all about love because I truly believe that love is a supernatural force. You know, it's like Jesus said, God is love. I think that love is actually a supernatural power. Um, and, you know, and um, one time in doing, uh, uh, Jim and I were doing some, I think we might've been doing hypnosis, but anyway, somewhere along the line, out came this sentence that love is the only constant through all realities, through all dimensions, through all universes. And I was just like, wow, love is the one constant through all those things, throughout all time. Yeah, really, really mind blowing. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. but oh, yeah. yeah, so it just feels like, um, it, I just feel like I'm very impassioned with this vision. And, um, and what blows my mind though, is how this has grown. I mean, it, it grew way beyond what I expected. When I put out the free class, um, we set a date and we said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll tell people that we're going to have this free class and it's going to happen on this date. And it's going to be a four day deal where it's like an hour a day for four days. And I thought maybe, you know, we might have like 300 people sign up, you know, that's, and we had 4,300 people sign up. That is mind blowing, mind blowing. And I guess, you know, statistically, they say that if you put something free out on the internet, like a webinar, and people sign up for it that you get a, if you get 20 percent of the people who sign up for it that actually watch the webinar that that's like doing great and yeah. we had 80 percent watch it 80 percent of this believable it was very unbelievable which showed me though there is a hunger for this people want to explore their own potential and so that really blew my mind and then i thought okay well if there's that many people who are really interested <clears throat> then i'm going to make this like an evergreen what they call an evergreen thing where it's out there all the time it's not on a specific date anymore it's just you know if, if you happen to stumble on it you can take this free class and so um so we're like okay let's take this you know let's put this free class out there and that way people actually do their own session you know if you go if you go watch a magician on stage you just think, wow, you know, that's a cool trick. I, you know, I don't have any clue how he did that. Um, but if you do something miraculous yourself and, it, and, you know, you know, you're not tricking you. So how did that even happen? That was my goal with the class was that people would actually, by the end of the fourth day, they've actually done a very basic remote viewing session. And then they get to see their feedback and they get to see if they actually remote viewed the target, what we call the target. And getting accurate data about something they have no way of knowing the details about. Exactly. So there you're giving them numeric coordinate coordinates that might even be randomly generated or just maybe it's a date, doesn't matter what the numbers are. And you're guiding people through a systematic process that enables them to tap into accurate data, multi-sensory. Exactly. About about something and then to get feedback on how they did, which we know actually helps people to do even better. It's so true. And so I get letters, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I get letters all the time from people saying, oh my gosh, this changed my life. Just the free class. And then they start using what they learned in the free class and they write me letters telling me how they used it. One lady wrote me and said, I used it to find my missing kitten. My kitten was missing. We didn't know where it was. So I, I sat down and I did your process that you taught in the free class. And I, by the description, I realized that the kitten was, uh, we have a bed that has drawers under the bed, you know, that are like storage drawers. And she said, I ran to the drawer and I pulled the drawer open and there was the kitten in the drawer. And, and you know, she, and she, they hadn't heard the kitten or anything, but she, and, you know, another person wrote and said how they had found their remote control for their TV. <laughs> they lost their TV remote, you know, things like that, that Finding they're just lost objects. Yes, yeah, finding lost objects and pets. And of course it can be used for, you know, the police have used it for a long time for finding missing people. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I, I know all of the people who know your work know that you have actually worked with law enforcement, that you have helped find missing people, that you have helped provide information that helps solve cases. But 
not everybody might be aware of that. I'm wondering if you could talk for a little bit about that, because that's a really remarkable use. Of it is, it is a remarkable use. Um, yeah, I, for about two years, I was involved um, with there, there's a group called Find Me, I believe it's, I think it's like findme.com. And it's, it's a group that, that uh, is headed up by a man who was a detective for many years. Um, and so he started this group and, and he has uh, dowsers, like professional dowsers and uh, people who have um, dogs, you know, like that sniff, you know, uh, what, search and rescue dogs. Yeah. And, uh, and then he has psychics and then he has remote viewers. And so for about two years, I worked with him. I eventually found that a steady diet of looking for missing people isn't really a healthy thing to do because, you know, some of the people we're searching for are not victims, they're criminals. And so, you know, that can get to be kind of dark after a while. I found that for me, especially, and I think probably for the health of the average remote viewer, if there is such a thing, you, you definitely want to vary things up. You want to do some fun stuff, some very light, high, lighthearted stuff. And then you want to, <clears throat> and then you want to do some stuff that feels really meaningful to you. Uh, we've used it for archaeology. We did a, we did a project, um, a really cool archaeological project where we helped this archaeologist who had spent 40 years of his life looking in a 200 square mile area of ocean for artifacts he believed were there, could not find them in 40 years. Um, we were able to do a mount a big project and give him the actual GPS coordinates. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and he was able to take boats and divers and go out there and he found everything he had been searching for, you know, walls with inscriptions, archways, all kinds of things. Um, and so it's, it's, it was really a fascinating project. I can't talk too much about it because believe it or not, it's still ongoing. Okay. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but the, the, the amazing thing about this project was that it felt so good. You know, it was so fun to, to actually do that. Um, we, so we do some fun things. We've, we've done a few fun TV show type things where, you know, where they take an incident from history where there's a lot of known information. And then the, the viewers are blind, what we call blind tasks. They're, they're asked to remote view something and not given any information about it other than a number, a coordinate number. And they um, and they just they just totally nail it and describe it so thoroughly. Uh, we have a mantra: describe, don't identify. You know that's such an important part of it because one of the things that controlled remote viewing teaches you is how easily we label things and jump to con erroneous conclusions on things. Um, and so you learn to move away from labels and stick to describing things. And uh, you know, so it's really um, kind of like they say in an argument for relationships, instead of saying, you're such a jerk. <laughs> if you say, actually, what happened made me feel like this, you know, and you, you express how whatever's going on is impacting you rather, rather than placing blame and calling and doing name calling and labels. So um, you learn a lot about yourself through this process. It's an amazing journey of self-discovery. So yes, yeah, so we worked on missing people cases, um, both criminals that were missing, you know, on the lam, and uh, and people who were missing. I worked on a on a big uh, kidnapping case that was, uh, you know, fascinating and that went on for several months, that had some amazing results. One of the things um, that, and again, I can't talk a lot about it, okay. but it, this kidnapping took place in a foreign country, and utilizing the techniques. Um, that we learn in the intermediate CRV course or controlled remote viewing course, I was actually able to get the name of the organization that had done the kidnapping and what their whole philosophy was. And that isn't something that's very common, but it was in a foreign language. And I wondered whether I should even turn it in because I was like, oh my gosh, this is suspect. You know, it's a, it's definitely a name. And it was kind of a long name in, in this foreign language, kind of like in English, the, it's, it, it, you know, we had the Symbionese Liberation Army. This was, it was a name like that. And um, I did turn it in. And interestingly, the investigative officers had never heard of this group. So then they researched it and sure enough, the group exists and was responsible for the kidnapping. Uh, but they had never, the researchers, I mean, the, the wow. investigators had never heard of it, <clears throat> you know? And so it's fascinating to me that we have the ability to send our minds out in time and space and, and obtain information about a specific thing and pull it back and report on it. Um, I know nothing about 
engines or mechanics or you know anything involving machines it's like totally doesn't interest me and I know nothing <laughs> about them and I was tasked with an airplane crash and the cause of it what was the cause of this airplane crash so um I I was told the target is an event describe the target that was all I was told so um, I just, I drew the, the plane accurately and the pilots, I even sketched the pilots accurately. And then um, I was kind of experiencing this airplane crash in the sense that everything was fine. I could even see out the windows of the, of the, of the uh, cockpit and see that there was land off to the left and ocean off to the right. Um, it took place of, uh, off the coast of Hawaii. And, um, and that uh, as I'm experiencing all this, I suddenly see that there's like something is going wrong and the plane is tilting and things are falling and there's some smoke and I say something is failing. And so um, my monitor, we have monitors in CRV sometimes, some, some, of, some of us, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, you can do it with or without, but uh, I, when, when we're doing something very important, we always try to make sure it's a monitored thing. So my monitor said, move to the failing and describe. So suddenly I am sketching the internal workings of an airplane engine. And my, my monitor's father was an airplane mechanic and, um, and was like, that is an accurate piece of the internal gearing of, of this engine. And it turned out that that engine, that particular engine in that plane ended up being problematic and set and caused several airplane crashes. And so, um, you know, it was just, it was interesting. And the reason that there was a question was because there were some people who had, you know, anger at the airline or had had a motive for causing the crash. But my, through my room of viewing, I found, no, it was, it was actually from the engine. It was a, you know, it was a mechanical a, a, failure, a mechanical failure. Um, and so, but I mean, when, how wild to find that. Yes. And how wild I'm not even, you know, I'm not an artist by any means, but I ended up accurately sketching this whole thing that's inside this case casing, you know, so, um, and, and thankfully, I mean, monitors are trained to be completely stoic, not to give away anything facially or in any other way. And I figured I had bored the monitor to death and then I had no idea whether I was accurate or not. And I was thought, am I making stuff up? Um, and, and then later the monitor's like, that's the best session you ever did. I mean, it was like very amazing. But what it showed me is how we don't even have to have knowledge about something. You know, you could be completely not know anything and still, you know, manage to describe something accurately, really accurately and sketch it even, you know, really so incredible technology. And it, it, I, I just want to point out something that a lot of people might not know is that you are, you know, you've talked about your kind of life path and how you wound up here. And again, it's not whatever we would expect. I don't know what we would expect, but it isn't that, right? You weren't no. somebody who had grown up in a family where everybody was psychic and, and working with law enforcement. And, you know, you, to, and you, you know, you have people come to your classes from all walks of life. Certainly a lot of people in law enforcement and a lot of people, ex-military, current military, maybe, I don't know. Um, but you have people from every walk of life who take your courses and actually learn to do this well. I wonder if you could describe yes. a little bit of that. Um, like who yeah. comes to you? We, I, I, tend to, I, I actually broke it down. I mean, I actually did, got data. Um, my, my mentor, Lynn Buchanan, uh, was the database keeper you know, in the unit. And so he was always emphasizing data, data, data. Let's keep data. The data is what separates a controlled remote viewer from you know, the gypsy fortune teller in the gypsy tent. So, so we're trying to separate things and really keep data so that we have concrete numbers. Like, um, like you, if you've done a hundred sessions and you've put all that information into the database, we might discover that you are 98% accurate on colors over a hundred sessions. Then we know if we have something that we might not get feedback on, but we need to know the color of it, uh, you're wow. you're our gal, right? You're the one to go to. So data is super important. And uh, when I broke down the data of who comes to me for classes, I found that it's um, slightly more women than men, but not I mean almost 50-50, but not quite. A slight a slight preponderance of women. The age range tends to be about 40 to 60. We have a few on on the extremes. We have some in our twenties, some in the twenties, some in the some in the. We have, I had some in my in the eighties, uh, but generally the bulk are between forty and sixty. 
And they generate about 70% of them are either entrepreneurs own their own businesses, or they are um, in a in a position where they are like the CEO of a company or, a, or an executive director or, you know, they're they're like the head of something. So a lot of leaders and uh, business people take the course, but it's often like I had the CEO of Sony many years ago, he's no longer with Sony, but years ago, the CEO of Sony um, for the whole hemisphere of the, the other hemisphere of the world where Australia is, took this course, we're still very good friends. And interestingly, he called, um, I think it was last Saturday. And uh, he said, now he has a production business where he puts famous people on stages. You see photos of him with Bruce Springsteen in One Direction. And, you know, he's always setting up concerts and that kind of thing. That's what he does now. And, um, and so we're talking and he talked about how he said the two weeks that I spent with you guys were the most amazing weeks of my life. And we're thinking, this is a guy who mingles with the rich and famous, travels all over the world, has been to every country in the planet. And he says the two weeks he spent with us was the most amazing weeks of his life. And he said, don't ever stop what you're doing because it's really important. He said, I feel like what I'm doing is not important, but what you guys are doing is changing lives. And it's causing people to think differently. That's the thing. Um, I was talking with my husband the other day and he said, what we're doing is causing people to, to think differently. Nowadays, Tracy, this is so important before we end yeah. this talk. And this is the most yeah, important perfect. thing. Because nowadays we're being so pulled apart and divided and it's really black and white thinking, right? We have, you know, one side says this and one side says that. But imagine as people learn to take their own power to actually, instead of being so swayed by people's opinions, to actually be able to remote view the truth of something for yourself and, and make a choice based on that rather than than so many people's opinions, because sometimes we're only shown a piece of something. I, I was really, it was really interesting many, many years ago, uh, we have friends who are extremely conservative and friends who are extremely liberal and we love them all, you know, we just really love them all. And uh, it, years ago on Facebook, we found that if we would go to the, the Facebook page of a friend who was extremely liberal, it was full of all these things that were extremely liberal and were stories like, did you know this and this happened? Or did you know that and that happened? Then you go to the extremely conservative person's Facebook page, exact same stuff, but for, but against the other side, right? It was like, it was like, it was the same, same rhetoric, but just like designed to push us apart and, and make us pit us against each other. And I, it was so stark when I looked at these two things and went, oh my gosh, how much more important does that make it? to learn a skill that allows you to see the truth of something without anyone else's influence. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And in, in many um, different aspects of one's life, you mentioned CEOs and entrepreneurs. And so in business for one's health, finding lost objects or people or pets. Um, and and um, the, the last thing I want to mention, because I know you've talked about this before, and I know Lynn has too, is that doing a discipline like this, it's not just that you're more intuitive during the session. In general, as you walk through life, things become clearer. It's so true. It is so true. The, just like two days ago, I was driving, I was teaching a class this last week, and I was driving to the office. And we have like four miles of dirt road that's really windy through the mountains. And I was tearing down that road because I was late as usual. Uh, and so I'm trying to get to the class on time and I'm driving really fast. And suddenly every cell in my body kind of went alert, alert, alert. And I pulled over and stopped. And then right around this blind curve comes this truck really fast. And I thought if I had not had that momentary warning, I would have, we would have had, we had, would have had a head on collision, you know, I mean, the road's really narrow. So I had to really literally pull off the road to get out of the way. And, um, and so I was just like, wow, you know, that was thankfully, you know, I mean, Jim and I were on a trip uh, in a 40 foot motorhome in the mountains wow. of Colorado and we're coming around this big, huge mountain curve, you know, so very large curve. And I suddenly said, Jim, slow down. I said, when you come around this curve, a very large animal is going to run out in front of us. So he slowed down immediately. I have a wonderful husband who believes, who really <laughs> believes in my ability. And so he it. immediately put on the brakes and he came, we came slower around the curve and this massive elk leapt out 
in front of us. And had we been going faster, we would have definitely been. Yeah, that would have been it. Would have been. And so, I mean, it's just, it, I can't tell you how many times it saved my life. Um, and not just my life, but other people I was with, you know. So intuition is a survival skill. It's a survival skill that we need right now because the world is changing very rapidly. And so yeah, this is, it's, it's important to make that investment in yourself. And, you know, uh, when people talk about money, um, if I am 64 years old, I'm going to be 65 in June. And we, you know, we could live very comfortably on my husband's retirement. I mean, you know, just we, our house is paid for. We could just very quietly live, putter away here. And, um, and believe me, that sounds good a lot of times. I'm just like, <laughs> man, I would like to do that. But, um, and this is a ton of work. I mean, the business yeah. has just exploding right now. I mean, we have mentoring clubs and we have courses on video and courses, uh, live courses and workshops that I'm teaching. And it's just a constant, you know, we're just working all the time. And, um, and yet it's like, I feel an urgency to do this. It's, there's an urgency to do it. And, uh, and so people say, well, why charge for it? Well, the only reason I charge for it is because now I have to have help and I have to pay the help. <laughs> and, you know, so, and plus to get the word out, we also pay for advertising and, uh, and I have to pay for an office that has, oh, there's my alarm. We have to pay for an office that has high-speed internet so I can actually teach people online and things. So that's the, you know, that's the only reason that we really charge. I think it's important to charge for what you do. I mean, we pay for everybody else's time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with paying for a good course. Lori, I know we, I need, I know we need to finish. So I wanted to just ask, we didn't talk about your book, but your new book is Boundless. People can learn a lot more about how they can become boundless and really expand their abilities where can people find out more about you and your work and your classes and your books? Yeah, I would love, um, I would love for us to put up the URL, which is kind of long, but if they okay. want to take the free class, okay. if they use okay. this URL for the free okay. class, um, then they, uh, then we can track and know how many people actually took the class because of this, because of this talk we're having here awesome. and the, and, and it's actually in my book. Um, so okay. the book is called boundless, your how-to guide to practical remote viewing by Lori Lambert Williams. You can find it on Amazon. Um, don't hate me for mentioning Amazon. I mean, it's just right now that was the easiest Where we get books. Get a lot of people. It's the way a lot of people get books now, but, um, and now we have it in span. Uh, it's coming out in Spanish very shortly, but it's also uh, available. It's already available in French. <laughs> Um, and so anyway, so we, you can find it there. Um, if you want the free class, there's a link in the book. You can buy it on Kindle. I think it's only like $4 and 99 cents on Kindle. Um, the, the printed book had to be a lot more expensive because it's got color pictures in it. So the printed book is like $29.95, but the, um, the book is so helpful and it's a very clear explanation of how to do this. I wrote it so that anyone could understand it. And I also included some of the fun stories that make a book more interesting. So I've it. heard that it's like the friendly remote viewing book. Um, but my goal was to make it a, a, an easy thing for people to be able to learn from. And hopefully the, the, the subsequent books will be coming out. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the website. Give me the, the link. I will yeah. post it. Okay. Yeah. It's just intuitive specialist.com slash masterclass hyphen series slash book. Okay. And if it has the word book at the end, that helps us just know that it, it's coming through here and not just from somebody going on the website, for example, and finding it. But um, anyway, so that's intuitive specialist with an end at the an S at the end of specialists. So intuitive specialist.com is the website. There's tons of free, in fact, there's a tab that says free stuff. Okay. There's a tab that says free stuff that has a lot of free goodies there. And then along the top, you can see where it says free masterclass. And uh, it's, a, it's a series in that it's four class, it's a four, four one hour segments. And uh, it comes every day for four days. If anybody has ever tried to see the masterclass previously, if they try to sign up again, they often get a link that says your, your link has expired. And the reason for that is we give people 10 days to watch it. And then if they don't watch it in 10 days, we have it go away because if it doesn't go away, people just never think, they, they just never watch it. They'll just think, oh, well, you know, I'll watch that someday. And they keep okay. putting it off. Whereas if they know there's a deadline, there's 10 days I, and it, it goes away after 10 days, 
then they do watch it. We have a lot, a really high percentage of people that actually watch it. And then if you forget about it, sometimes things happen, life gets in the way, you forget about it, it expires. Um, just, you can write to info at intuitivespecialist.com or support at intuitivespecialist.com and just say, hey, um, I really wanna take the class, but my links are expired and we'll, we'll help you get to watch it again. We'll give you another 10 days to try it. <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. And, and for anyone who's curious, I've taken Lori's training. She is warm. She is thoughtful. She is thorough. And she's um, exquisitely skilled at what she teaches and does. And I, you, won't, you won't regret doing it. So if you're curious about the courses, definitely please check out Lori's books and her website and her teachings. Lori, thank you so much for making time for me today. It was so great catching up. It was. It was so fun to see you again. After, <laughs> it's been a while. We haven't seen you so a little bit. So um, this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you want more information about Lori, you can visit her website and I'll put that um, in print for you to find it as well. And until next time. Mm -hmm.